when machine processors are making critical decisions on my behalf that concern my future, my life, my family, then that becomes a very big risk to me as an individual, but also shapes the society that we're going to live in. You know, to give people tools that they can control their own data is, is a very minority geeky type of thing. Um, I think it's far better to go after the systems that incentivize marketers to catch that data. Hello everyone, I am Sergio Maldonado and this is Masters of Privacy, a set of interviews covering the intersection of marketing, data, privacy and technology with a clear goal in mind which is redefining the relationship between people, brands and publishers around transparency and control. Which is to say, we're aiming for real customer centricity or if you will, human centricity. It may take us five years, ten years or more, but we're patient. We're enjoying the ride, pushing our ideas farther with every single one of our guests. Speaking of which, let's get on with the show. Okay, we have Cam Diaz with us today. He's a partner at Three Points Digital. That's part of the MSQ group of digital agencies, where he's growing the data strategy and personal data practice. Gam previously co-founded e-commerce consultancy First Retail. And prior to that, he was head of data strategy at Aviva Insurance. And he is an associate professor at IE Business School. Let's get started. Gam, thank you for joining us. <laughs> You're very welcome. I think we've been talking and talking and talking. It's nice to actually point it at something. We met at My Data Madrid. We've been running that together and we've been meeting in person and then trying to do it online. And we are both teaching at IE as well. And that's how we've met. And the common sort of uh, topic is that we want to push this forward. But what is this? So what are we looking for? That's, that's, that's a perfect intro because um, the My Data and the IE experience both kind of talk to this very well. Um, when I'm teaching, certainly, and I don't know how your experience is, the students are fascinated and they identify with this, this idea that my data is, is mine and I need some control. Um, yet, they, like everybody else, have no tools to make that happen. Now, the, the experience of my data is, is equally interesting because it's a lot of people who are privacy geeks um, coming either with different technologies or different ideas, particularly, um, you know, you've introduced me to however many privacy lawyers there are. And that's a, that's a, you know, it's a very legal game at the moment. So if it's legal and technology and very little marketing, we're probably all waiting for some sort of adoption. And there's, a, you know, the My Data movement, particularly, you know, My Data Global, is a lot of technologists working on some very smart solutions um, yet it hasn't had mass adoption. And I'm feeling like we are all like captured bison in this corral waiting for somebody to open that gate. And that gate represents a piece of technology that consumers actually understand and adopt um, wildly and virally. And then we're all going to pursue that and we're going to start there and go in many different directions. Um, and so... I think we're all waiting for that because nobody's really cracked what control or privacy or agency is yet, um, not yeah. meaningfully enough for a consumer. So that's it, because in the end, it seems like we end up zooming in on personal agency. But as you say, even within my data, we had the event the other day, we had a workshop. People were asking, and this is native English speakers, they were asking, what in the world is personal agency? So what is agency? It's a tough question, isn't it? Because um, if we knew the answer to that, we, we would be out the gate. Um, so I think when you talk to people who've been in the privacy space for a while, um, there's this spectrum of control that they want. You know, some people want all their data um, on their own device, and they can do whatever they want with it. Um, and other people don't care. 
they don't really don't care. They don't understand where their data is and they don't care. And the sweet spot is going to be somewhere in the middle of that. Um, if you look at um, a lot of the technologies, you know, maybe solid is an example. Um, nobody, well, there's probably about 10 people in the world who want to download a pod and put their data in it daily and manage that data at such a granular level. It's, it's mm. a pain in the neck. Yeah. Um, most people can't manage their money, leave alone manage their data. So if you're asking me to know what data I have and to be able to share it with certain people for certain times, it, it's gonna be a mystery to me. So my belief is that um, there are going to be custodians of our data. And those custodians will manage our data, manage who gets to see it. And all we get to do is set policy. And I, and I use the um, analogy of my 401k. My 401k sits um, in a US brokerage. Um, I set various policies. And within that policy, you know, things like do not invest in Africa or invest in emerging markets or, you know, can you put some stuff into bonds because it's too risky right now? I want that level of policy with my data as well. I don't want to have to manage every individual transaction. So I'm feeling like there is room for a set of services that manage our data as part of something else they do. And, and those services will be in things like healthcare. Um, they will be in finance. They will be in very specific areas that matter to me. Um, I don't know if you've, you've come across the Internet of Bodies. No, what's that? So you've got a bunch of wearables on that tell you, but you've also got a bunch of micro devices embedded inside you. Um, and all of those things will contribute to your digital physiological twin. So that's one area that I think that's very much my data because it's my digital twin that I need to manage. Now, I don't, there's a lot of signals going in and out of that machine. I don't want them. But you know what? Maybe my primary care physician should see them every now and again. Yeah. That's, that's how that data needs to be rolled up. And then when there's a problem, maybe I'm coming up to have a heart attack. My physician will call me and say, hey, Gam, you're about to have a heart attack. Um, we need you to come in and have a service. Okay, because that means that um, control an agency doesn't need to be coupled with understanding of everything. And in the end, I guess that's what's happening. There's so much data that when we talk about personal data stores and pods and so on, we seem to simplify it and think of categories that we all understand so that we can look at it and see what it is and feel like it's a password management platform of some sort that saves us time because we have the same predefined data sets when in, the, in reality where data is most valuable is where it belongs to a particular space as for example as you say in health where there's so many parameters so many metrics that you want that me not being a doctor wouldn't be able to understand but i do understand the general category i know what they do in general as a whole so perhaps that's the answer is that the answer having something that you control, but it doesn't necessarily have to be so static or so understandable. That's beautifully put. Um, I think being able to decouple agency with understanding the data is a very, very important concept. Um, I liken it to the early types of motor car. Um, if you think about what you had to do to drive a car, you really needed to understand um, the fuel and air mix. And you had two little gadgets that you could adjust the fuel and air mix to make your engine run. Today's car, we've decoupled the understanding of the engine and we've actually given it an application. And the application is take me from A to B. So now I have a tool set, which is a steering wheel and a pedal and a speedometer. And they allow me to drive the car and I have no, no understanding of how that engine works. Let's jump forward to the cars that will be available in 10 years time. Well, they'll drive themselves um, 
and I will have no need to understand even how to navigate the road. The car will manage that for me. All I need to tell the car is my end destination and what I want to do while I'm traveling. Um, and I think that that maturity, so what, what this demonstrates, this little interchange that we've had demonstrates that the, um, I don't know whether to call it privacy any, anymore, but the industry that we're discussing is very, very mature and it needs some stages to move forwards. And I think this decoupling of data and privacy um, should happen um, with, with the actual experience of trying to do stuff, um, which sort of brings me on to, you know, the whole conversation of convenience. So if you, if you observe consumers' behavior, so whenever you read one of the surveys um, put out by the privacy or someone's interested in making money on privacy, um, they commission a survey and the survey invariably says that people care deeply about their data, they, they want their privacy and they do not trust large corporations with their data. Um, and all of these people who are so concerned are downloading TikTok on Android. This is, this is the privacy paradox. People are aware of it, but they do nothing about it, uh, and partly because they don't have the tools. But I think the most important thing to consider is the benefits that you get outweigh the concerns they have about privacy. Yeah. So TikTok gives people, it gives a small number of people a way to make a large amount of money, and a large amount of people um, a form of in, a form of free entertainment um, and social standing, and so the benefits are very clear, and the risks are there, but they're intangible. So people tend to do this. So I think that nobody is going to buy privacy. It's not something. It's an artificial concept. It's an artificial concept that um, I feel that we've only had it in in the last, what, 50 to uh, 50 years, um, you know, now children have their own bathroom. Um, mm. You know, when I grew up, there was one bathroom for the whole family. Um, and prior to that, you know, we might have all lived in the same hut and there weren't any rooms or doors and we lived in a village and everybody knew everybody's business. Um, yet privacy in those situations becomes a series of, I guess, manners manners and protocols that society accepts. So now we've been fighting to create this, this concept that never actually existed um, sociologically. So, um, so if we drop this notion of privacy and start to think about what benefits and what conveniences can I offer the consumers, um, that might be a different way to think about how we deliver this. Yeah, that's very good. Because then why would you do it? So, because from, from a point of view, privacy is so right. It's, it's not tangible. And the closest, I believe, I've got to something tangible out there is explaining that privacy is about protecting your future choices so that you're hampering your, your future and future of others around you because you do affect you know, society and your family, for example, with your, whatever you do today in terms of how you expose cer certain, you know, traits will affect your choices. But still, if, if you don't have that, and that's not something people are going to, again, to, to pursue, then what is it that we can deliver in terms of value for people or businesses or society at large? I mean, what are we chasing? You said so much there. Um, I'm going to jump back to the first part of your question about, um, about protecting our future. And I think there are people who understand artificial intelligence and the risks of that, um, the risks of algorithms determining our future or constraining our future. Um, we are moving towards a world of Gattaca where my future employment prospects are determined by the blood that I carry um, at birth. And so when that future becomes real, when, when machine processes 
are making critical decisions on my behalf that concern my future, my life, my family, then that becomes a very big risk to me as an individual, but also shapes the society that we're going to live in. And that's a scary future. And I think if you bubble up, what we're all trying to achieve with privacy is we're trying to protect that future, exactly. And so how do we best do that? And the consequence of digital marketing and the fact that we leave this trail of data behind us um, is, is socially very close to our DNA being exposed and what we are capable of um, and what we are not capable of and, and decisions being made upon that. And so it's almost like um, having everything preordained because of the data that we've left behind, the machine makes decisions. And so we act, what we're actually looking for is our freedom. Yeah, very good. It's freedom. That's perfect. And, and so, okay, now we need a motivation, right? So following that, chasing that tipping point and looking for a change in the way things are working, uh, you and I have focused on marketing a lot. Because marketing, in a way, is at fault for many of the things that we have today that don't seem to work, but not just because of privacy or lack of agency, but also because there's an imbalance with many other players being affected. So do you think that because it is there that the challenge started, so marketing, the internet, that because the whole thing became more evident in that space, we should solve it in that space? Ah, that's a great question. Yes, um, absolutely. Do, do you remember Peppers and Rogers one-to-one -one marketing? No. Back in the day. Okay. Well, that was when I was at Oracle. I was I was at a CRM group in Oracle, and that was the Bible. Um, and they told us it was all about customer relationships, and but unfortunately, those words didn't get heeded so much by the marketers at the time. They got heeded by the technology companies. And what we had at technology companies was databases. So that became the championing cry to implement a database. And if we, if we could put all our customers into a database and all their traits and characteristics and their behaviors, we could segment them and instead of needing to talk to one customer at a time, I could talk to a thousand customers and they all feel like I'm having this conversation individually with them. Personalization. Now, if you move, if you progress all of this forward, how it evolved was then we started cooking people and we were able to follow them and we were able to market to them based on their past behaviors it started to go further because we started to get all algorithmic and we started to be able to predict behaviors. So the girl that was pregnant that Target figured out and emailed her mother, that's the kind of dangerous side of where this could go because we're making predictions. And that was, in that case, it was a correct prediction. Sometimes we're making incorrect predictions. And of course you've got sampling bias and all sorts of things in the machine that cr create the problems. Now, it's really the digital marketer that has the greatest incentive to follow us and use our data. Now, let's just take a group of 10 competing companies. And if one of them says, I'm going to stop doing that with your data, then all of the others are going to advance. And that one company that took the leap will fail. Yeah, um, And no marketer in their right mind is going to give up share when they could keep it. So instead of telling them like GDPR and CCPA is telling them to stop doing something, what we need to do is find them a better, more efficient way, because then the first marketer that's going to let go of that second and third party data is going to accelerate past the others. Um, yeah. Perhaps they're going to dip back for a little while, but we need to create something that's going to allow, that's going to give them advantage when they're competing. Okay, that's very good. But then there's the other way, which is what many of us have believed for a long time. Give people decentralized environments, personal data stores, empowerment, and they will push companies 
into adapting to their personal information management systems, personal data stores, whatever, and then the world will change. What do you think is more likely or will they meet in the middle? I think, as I, as I mentioned before, I think um, data is even more intangible than money. So I think, you know, to give people tools that they can control their own data is, is a very minority geeky type of thing. Um, I think it's far better to go after the systems that incentivize marketers to catch that data. And if we can, if you, if you look at what's happened to marketing um, in the stock market, um, financial derivatives has resulted in an increasing gap between the institutions and the individual. And in marketing, the derivatives of usage of customer data have resulted in the inefficiency of marketers. Because what marketers are doing now, they're not spending to get their message over. The, the increase in marketing spend is going to compete to get your message read over everybody else's. And so the only winner in that is the companies that run the programmatic ads. Um, so I believe that the, the revolution is going to come from a more efficient and effective way to reach and engage your customer. So there's engagement, acquisition, and then there is conversion and, the, and then retention. And I believe that personal data has a role to play in all of those, um, but maybe we're gonna have to go back to a time when advertising was ultra creative because we needed to acquire and engage customers then rather than follow them around and say, I look like you and therefore I should buy this. But, you know, recently I was served some contextual ads and I was quite taken aback because they were completely useless and irrelevant to me. I was reading an article on popular mechanics about zebras and, and why they're stripy. And I was getting all sorts of strange books that I wasn't interested in. and you know, I've become used to seeing in the recommendations, you know, things that I never quite bought on Amazon or things that I looked at. And I'm not quite sure what's more, what's more useful. Um, perhaps neither. Perhaps what I want to be able to do is be able to set my own cookies on my own machine and tell any advertiser what I might be interested in. Look, I'm in the market for something. Um, why don't, you know, wherever I wander around the web, why don't you show me stuff? So speaking of marketing, you've ended up at Three Points Digital, uh, which is part of the MSQ group. What do they do and, uh, and why, or how does privacy fit within a marketing agency? How do they see the future? Yeah, so um, Three Points Digital is a digital transformation consultancy. Um, and the MSQ group is a, is a conglomerate of agencies. Um, primarily in the digital space that do everything from um, technology build out to um, media buying. So they, they cover the whole gamut of the digital engagement space. Um, and part of this is they have been thinking very differently about, about privacy, about engagement, about the conversations that they have with customers. And I'm hoping that my practice on data strategy and customer data um, brings a very different angle to, to that, to allow them to explore the alternative ways of engaging rather than um, simply following your customer around. Now they've got to buy into that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, it sounds promising. Okay, so any final thoughts, any, any readings? You can share it later and we'll add them to the links, but if there's anything else you want to add, yeah, um, I, I, there aren't. I don't want you to read privacy books um, because I think they're they're already biased in trying to help people become um, trying to live a life of privacy when it's not something that we don't want. I I would far recommend a book called Simplicity by John Maeda, and John Maeda is a um, professor at MIT, and Simplicity is a book about how to design. Um, user experiences and products. Um, it's a very short book. It's very simple. <laughs> it's very thin. Um, and I, I would, as you're thinking about how you make your customer's life easier, 
and more convenient and remove the friction from the experience. The book Simplicity will give you some very, very good pointers as to how to go about that. Gam, thank you for joining us. It was, it was a good conversation. Thank Sergio, you. looking forward to our ongoing conversations. Okay, that's all for today. Please find episode notes and links to our social channels and other feeds on mastersofprivacy.com. Please do not give us five stars on your favorite podcasting channel unless you believe there is no more room for improvement. Your candid feedback is probably more useful to us. Thank you.